Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Alicia Chawla and part of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team at the School of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Sciences Student Society. We've been working with the Science, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team at the UNSW to bring today's seminar on neurodiversity well, movement in science. Um, I would like to start our discussion today by acknowledging the direct people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking today. And I would also like to pay my respect to the elders past and present and to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are here with us this afternoon. If you would like to, I would encourage you to recognize which land you're joining from in the chat. Today's session will be recorded. So if you need to leave early or miss any part, you can watch this again at your convenience as the link to the recording will be emailed to everyone who has registered. We encourage active audience participation as this is a discussion more than a presentation. Please use the live Q&A chat function for any questions you may have and we will address as many as possible. Okay, so I'm very pleased to be hosting today's discussion topic on neurodiversity, which is an important concept in terms of equity, diversity and inclusion. To begin our session today, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we'll start off with Isabel Latucci, who is an equity program coordinator. Uh, Isabel? Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me on your panel today. Uh, my name is Isabel. I work in the Central Peer Connections team here at UNSW, which essentially looks after all things peer mentoring and peer support, specifically for uh, new students coming into the uni. I was once a student of UNSW myself as well, and I have a physical disability, uh, which is probably the reason why I have so much passion in the area of disability advocacy. I, uh, after leaving uni, I went and worked in the disability space for about five years and now have come to the university and want to do as much as I can to change our conversation around disability, include a bit more disability pride and um, really change the visibility of disability at UNSW as well, which is why I started as a disability champion from April and I'm really passionate about making sure that we have a really great community of disability, especially amongst students at UNSW. Thank you. Um, we have Dr. Samuel Arnold as well on the panel today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Cabrigal clan of the Darug Nation. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm a psychologist. To, um, I only do a little bit of clinical work. I work mostly as a uh, lecturer and researcher at the Department of Developmental Disability Neuropsychiatry, 3DN, uh, with the School of Psychiatry, UNSW. Just finishing um, a postdoctoral position with the Autism CRC, the Co uh, Collaborative Research Centre uh, for uh, Living with Autism. Uh, and I'm also the convener of the Australian Psychological Society, APS, uh, Psychology, Psychology of Intellectual Disability and Autism Interest Group. Thanks. Thank you, Samuel. Um, we have Aaron Berg from the School of Science, the Faculty of Science. Hi there, my name's Aaron. Uh, I started studying at UNSW in 2020 and I'm an advanced Bachelor of Science and we're majoring in Neuroscience and Microbiology. I'm a neurodiverse student and a proud member of the LGBTQI community. I was diagnosed over four years ago, or just a little bit over four years ago, with ADHD and all the other subset disorders that are associated with it, like dyslexia, anxiety, and mild depression. I've also been diagnosed with binge eating disorder and dissociated dissociation disorder that stems from childhood trauma. I struggle with being organized and get overwhelmed really easily. All that being said, I love advocating for neurodiversity and I'm also a part of a first of its kind student led product, uh, project called Diversify, which I'll discuss later on. Um, there will also be links added into the chat for those who are interested in finding out more about Diversify and also who, for people who are wanting to register for the event as well, um, which will be discussed later on. Thanks. 
Thanks, Erin. Uh, we have uh, Associate Professor Irina from the School of Fabs as well on the panel. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be part of the panel today. Um, I'm um, in the School of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Sciences. Uh, I'm a geneticist and my research is on um, the uh, molecular genetics of autism spectrum disorder. So that's one of my uh, links to neurodiversity from a research uh, standpoint. I have also uh, been involved with uh, Albert in a relatively small capacity, but have been involved in the Autism Cooperative Research Center that um, was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and I'm aware of um, uh, people on the autism spectrum being heavily involved in the governance of that cooperative research center, uh, which is a, a very interesting um, approach uh, to driving research. Also, from a more uh, personal uh, standpoint, I really think that neurodiversity is a very important concept in the way we all live and um, work, especially uh, in a highly creative research space, such as um, um, you know, um, running a lab on understanding the genetic basis of neurodevelopmental disorders, but also in education where we work with um, students with so many talents and so many uh, different uh, neurocognitive uh, traits. So um, I'm very grateful that you guys have organized this event. Thank you so much uh, to all the panel members members and we truly appreciate your time to be on the panel today. Okay, so just to give a little bit of context, um, our discussion is based on two articles that explore different concepts and issues about neurodiversity. First is a scientific article published in The Lancet titled The Neurodiversity Concept. Is it helpful for clinicians and scientists? It expands on the benefits of adopting a neurodiversity-based approach to research in addition to the disorder-based framework, both of which have one aim, um, to provide evidence-based strategies to support people who identify as neurodiverse. The second is a Forbes article um, which is titled From Deficit to Superpower, Is It Ableist to Focus on Neurodivergent Strengths? It is authored by Nancy Doyle, who is a CEO of Genius Within, a company specializing in the organizational science of neurodiversity. The article focuses on uh, the delicate balance between celebrating the strengths of neurodiverse people and placing too much pressure on people who identify as neurodiverse to perform and demonstrate unique abilities and to be superhuman. But before we dive into this, uh, we think it is important to understand the term neurodiversity itself. It is a very broad and general term and different people can have different interpretation of what it includes. Um, so we might start off with Dr. Arnold. Um, Sam, what, are your, um, what is your understanding of the term neurodiversity and how might you define it? Um, thank you. So I think in understanding neurodiversity, I think of biodiversity and its link to that term. And we all know how important biodiversity is. And so neurological diversity would also appear to be very important and that helps us to focus on uh, difference as opposed to deficit that, you know, there's no one single way for a human brain to be wide that is the right way and that generally difference is a good thing. It's not good if everything or everyone is the same. It's a benefit to all of us, to the human project, if we do a better job of integrating, accommodating, and supporting neurodivergent people. That's what I think of. Yeah, thank you um, for that definition. Um, Isabel, what's your viewpoint and what, how would you define neurodiversity? Thank you. I was thinking about this question and I was thinking about it more potentially from a bit of an advocacy and disability perspective. Uh, and I was looking at two models of thinking and I know that these are brought up a little bit in the articles as well, uh, but we have been mostly brought up and a lot of conversations still to this day 
is brought is around thinking about the medical model of disability. So in this model, we look at an individual and we look at what makes them abnormal. We look at what makes them dysfunctional, uh, and especially in the neurodiverse space, we've looked at um, the person and, and seeing what was wrong. Uh, and generally, this is a model where we look at somebody as well and think about how they need to be fixed or cured in order to participate in society. Uh, but now what we're really trying to push for and what we're trying to get people to think about a little bit more is the social model of disability. Uh, so the social model of disability looks at disability being a social construct. So um, this indicates that the disability is caused by barriers in society, which is very relevant when looking at the terminology of neurodiversity. It's not to say that there isn't difference or that people don't have an impairment or that that's um, not impactful because that would be to discount the challenges uh, that neurodivergent people have overcome as well as their strengths and uniqueness and their individuality. Um, but it's the notion that people should be um, neuro, neurotypical in order to uh, enjoy the full range of ex human experience and that that shouldn't be the case. Uh, an impairment shouldn't constitute a limit to access or inclusion and the onus should be on society to change in order to create a more inclusive space. So I think that um, one of the ways that we kind of picture this, and this is actually taken a, a bit of a quote taken by People with Disability Australia, which is a really great organisation that I really encourage people to check out. Um, and they say, it is not the inability to walk that keeps a person from entering a building by themselves, but the stairs that are inaccessible that keeps a wheelchair user from entering that building. So it's really flipping that model on its head. Uh, and I think that that space really gives us a lot of room to celebrate difference and to encourage and celebrate looking at people's strengths. Absolutely. Um, and just on you know, the importance of accessibility and the importance of including the social model of neurodiversity, the Lancet article also talks about the importance of adopting a neurodiversity based research. Um, so maybe Irina, can you give us a brief outline of your research, potentially also examples of projects where neurodiverse individuals have collaborated on research design and the advantage of this? Sure. Um, so I'm working on understanding the genetic basis of autism, uh, particularly from a molecular genetic standpoint. And as the Lancet article uh, mentioned, autism is a very heterogeneous condition in that um, a lot of uh, people who have the same um, clinical manifestations in, in fact have very different um, genetic uh, makeup. And so um, that is uh, something that we are trying to understand in terms of um, uh, the focus of, of research. And we're tr also trying to understand how these different genetic uh, makeups converge, because they do converge at some point um, uh, in terms of cellular functions um, and um, their behavioral uh, outcomes. Um, now, what I would like to mention in terms of the definition of uh, neurodiversity um, um, as well um, and relating to the uh, Lancet paper. Um, so definitely a lot of us have been brought up uh, with the thinking um, of um, uh, psychiatric and neuropsychiatric conditions in general as being a dysfunction. And what everyone in uh, the research space is uh, more and more recognizing is that it is really a very wide spectrum. So, and it's not only ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. Um, anxiety, depression, psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, all of these things actually uh, are neurocognitive traits that exist in the general population on a spectrum. And so it is this diversity uh, that uh, is important and um, uh, that is a, a rich resource uh, of us humans, right? Um, so all of these traits are exist on, on, a, on a spectrum and that's what constitutes diversity. Now, um, it is, uh, 
you know, th there is a neurotypical um, uh, model. Um, and so each of these uh, traits would represent some sort of a difference from being neurotypical. Uh, but at the same time, it does not mean that uh, it is something wrong or a disorder uh, for everyone who uh, has some variation across this spectrum. But at the same time, one needs to acknowledge that uh, there is a point where a trait becomes a disease. Um, and I think this is a very um, sort of difficult um, um, line to draw perhaps, but it is also important to draw it. Uh, and it is important um, for uh, helping out uh, people uh, who need the help. And uh, I would be curious to know what other people think, but uh, personally, I would say that at the point where someone suffers before because of a neurocognitive trait, that's when we go from a trait to a disease. And um, now we can discuss the fact that oftentimes this suffering, uh, as Isabel said, it can be caused by the way the environment is structured around you. Um, and so there are situations in which society contributes to this um, suffering and stigma is, is an important uh, way in which this happens. Um, and so in terms of research projects where neurodiverse um, individuals uh, have contributed to research, I briefly mentioned the Autism Cooperative Research uh, Center where people with um, who are on the spectrum contribute to um, and um, uh, make decisions on the type of research that is uh, undertaken. And I think uh, that is an incre incredibly important uh, contribution to selecting uh, the research that is relevant to people with lived experience. Now, at the same time, at the very severe end of this spectrum, there are people who don't have a voice. Um, so people with autism um, who are so severely impaired that they cannot uh, speak or uh, so uh, severe in their repetitive behaviors that, um, you know, that they really suffer from uh, self-harm. Um, at that end, people don't have a voice. Um, and uh, I am wondering, um, and I feel a need to be cautious in terms of how far we draw the distinction between diversity and disease to not ignore uh, that end where people can not uh, really communicate how severe their suffering is and how much help they do need. Um, um, in in that space as well. And um, that's all uh, from me. I think I may have overrun my time. No, thank you so much uh, for that explanation and your interpretation of it and the importance of, you know, getting appropriate help for um, the people who need it. Um, I just wanted to also quickly ask Sam, um, can you give us a little bit of an outline about your research and maybe some projects that where you've collaborated with neurodiverse individuals. Thank you. Um, so for the last four years or so, um, being primarily focused on the Australian Longitudinal Study of Autism in Adulthood, which has been funded by the Autism CRC, and then a lot of related projects and student projects uh, relating with autism and, and all of this work and uh, work into the future as well, we really try to use an inclusive research approach. There's different levels of inclusive research from sort of consultation at the lower end up into uh, co-production where the research is done together in partnership with autistic P researchers or uh, even other levels where the autistic person does the research supported by um, as needed uh, academic colleagues. I guess the ones that might be of interest to talk about, um, done some things around employment and loneliness, but perhaps going back to some of the earlier discussion, I think one that's interesting in this space is um, recently uh, we co-produced, and I should also mention, sorry, um, that the, where the, a uh, licensed co-production partner with the Autism CRC uh, in recognition of some of this work. 
Um, so with Julianne Higgins, who's an autistic adult and peer researcher, and I'm really uh, I'm disappointed that Julianne's not here talking about this with us today. Uh, the, so Julianne, um, together we've done a project around autistic burnout. So autistic burnout is a condition um, which can be quite significantly impairing. Uh, it's characterized by social, um, you know, social interpersonal oral and exhaustion, and uh, it can also impact on functioning and executive functioning in other areas of life as well. And this autistic burnout uh, appears to arise from the stress for an autistic person in their everyday life, the stress of an unaccommodating neurotypical world, uh, and amongst other stresses. And they, they, there's also conceptually this concept of masking or camouflaging this idea that an autistic person needs to uh, hide their autistic traits and their identity in order to um, interact with the neurotypical world. And then over extended periods of time that that, that the effort of, of masking and and um, interacting in a world that's uh, the unaccommodated neurotypical world can lead to that autistic burnout. So I think that sort of gets to that social model aspects around where does the disability arise from. Um, and going back to collaboration, to do that research on autistic burnout, to do it well, I really couldn't have done it by myself. I really needed Julianne, who's an insider researcher, having experienced autistic burnout, being an autistic person, to really understand and communicate and that depth of existential experience. Uh, it's not something that could be done uh, without using an inclusive research approach. Uh, and just one or two last examples I'll try and be quick uh, loneliness. We're doing a, a student project around loneliness, which I thought was really interesting. And the inclusive researchers uh, through a consultation process, uh, the autistic advisors, they highlighted to us that although you might want to be alone, that doesn't mean that you also experience loneliness. So understanding some of that concept. And then in the future, an inclusive research approach, there were people with intellectual disability. I'm excited to be starting a project that's looking at contribution as an outcome measure that we all make contribution and that sometimes the contributions that we make unless they're valued with a dollar figure are sort of overlooked and so trying to refocus how we value people focusing on contribution and that we all contribute in different ways and uh, looking to measure that as an outcome linked to a happy valued life so hope i haven't said too much i hope that was interesting i'll hand back no absolutely and just about speaking from the importance of um, the experiences of individuals who identify as neurodiverse. I think both articles indicate that environment structures based in accordance with neurotypical perspectives can be limiting for neurodiverse people. So maybe Aaron, could you reflect on the experience of, a neurodivergent, of neurodivergent people in higher education and their experiences? Right. Um, reflecting on my own personal experience of being at a neurodiverse student at UNSW, um, which I would definitely say is predominantly a neurotypical environment. Um, it's been quite challenging as navigating my way through my first year has been really tough, especially um, like starting uni at the age of 30 and being diagnosed four years ago. Um, <clears throat> I find that being at UNSW and thinking academically, it's all just so new to me. And I feel that um, I think it's like a brand new environment to adapt to. Like I'm trying my best, um, but it's like fitting like a circular block into a square hole. It just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. And it just makes me question myself over and over again. And like, um, I guess like things like uh, well, neurodiverse movements like this, for example, and also the diversified project uh, that I'm a part of. Like I slowly feel that university uh, university environments um, like will have to adapt and make more like circular shaped holes um, in order to like cater for neurodiverse perspectives to be heard. So the current framework can be upgraded because it just yeah, it doesn't work for me and I'm sure there's many other students that feel the same way and also um, yeah, there just needs to be like more awareness around neurodiversity and how like I guess neurotypical perspectives and neurodiversity 
diverse perspectives can somewhat intertwine intertwine into a more like um, manageable manageable fit. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, um, Aaron. Uh, speaking of that intertwining um, sort of narrative, I think the Forbes article discusses like the deficit versus superpower narrative. Um, so maybe Isabel, could you explain how important it is in terms of our community? Yeah, sure. Um, when I was looking at this article and I was looking at how they were talking about the deficit versus superpower narrative um, and how to find balance in this, I think that the conversation is at a base level around how we value people. Uh, so I think it was great that Irina brought up the real variety of experience of people who are neurodiverse and that you have people in that experience as well who have very high support needs. Uh, and why is it that we value people more if they have that uh, quality or contribution that can be capitalised on or that has some economic benefit? Uh, but we have people with high support needs who are valuable because they exist and because they are a, a beloved family member and they are a person who should have just as much value in society, uh, but we can't monetize that. So they don't get that same uh, level of respect and value. So I think it's a question around the fact that people should potentially never have to earn their value and respect. and. Um, when we're looking at this deficit versus superpower narrative, uh, we're obviously uh, sometimes focusing very heavily on the superhero strengths, um, which is great. I don't think that there should be a situation where we have people who do wonderful things that benefit society and we don't celebrate them. There should definitely be space to celebrate greatness, celebrate skill and celebrate wonderful achievements. Uh, but what are we leaving out of the picture and are we not discussing people who have potentially the the soft skills you know and and that's a term we generally use around qualities that are a bit more loving or uh, bring joy to people's lives or are really empathetic or maybe creative in uh, musical ways or uh, other things like that potentially they don't get the same kind of um, spotlight and so then when we're looking at a UNSW con context and maybe why this is important in the UNSW framework and in our community and our society, I think that it's uh, important that we continue to praise, highlight and create visibility across a variety of human experience. So we look at um, all kinds of different kinds of experience with neurodiversity and we celebrate achievements uh, and strengths and skills and wonderful things that people are doing uh, in lots of different areas and not just areas that are going to benefit capitalism or benefit our eco economy. Um, but we look at lots of different wonderful ways that people are contributing and we try to continue to have these kinds of conversations as well because I think that there's nuance and we need to continue to comp uh, talk about these sorts of things so that there is space for everyone and it's there's space for us to talk about all different kinds of people and think about how and question how we value people. Um, so I think that this is a really great first step, but we also just need to keep pushing for greater visibility. We need lots of wonderful, complex, intersectional people being highlighted for lots of different wonderful reasons. Thank you, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. Um, the importance of having like a continued conversation about this. Um, just as well, Aaron, maybe what was your insight on this um, from your own personal experience? Well, I totally agree with what Isabel has just said. Um, like, it just makes so much sense just to not like value someone's like, um, from, like a monetary perspective as well. I think that like, um, a neurodivergent perspective in say like uh, like a problem solving like um, kind of environment it's just it's just so valuable um, and I think that um, yeah there definitely needs to be more awareness and just more um, more movements like this starting to happen because uh, like we don't know where it's going to lead and I think from like my my own experience like um, 
find that like being diagnosed four years ago with all the disorders that I mentioned before was just like such a blessing in disguise. Um, like I just, it's just like I'll usually like it just feels like there's like an invisible weighted blanket being lifted off you, and I guess like the more lighter you feel, the more capable you feel that you are within society, if that makes sense. Um, and like on this path of like being four years diagnosed, like it's taken a lot of energy and effort and um, a lot of time and energy to like find out what my strengths and weaknesses are. And even though uh, like there's been a lot more troughs than peaks on this journey, there has been like light at the end of the tunnel. And um, even though I don't have consistency yet with like what I would call like a, an activated state of flow, like a flow state, um, which like when I'm involved in something that I'm really passionate about, like it's like uh, I feel capable and I just feel like I've got um, I'm fully functional. But that doesn't happen all the time. And I feel that like, um, yeah, it's just hard to keep up consistency with those types of things and um, like that can be classed as a superpower for me, but also like um, something like being organized on a daily basis, especially with like factoring in things outside of uni. It's just so difficult for me to manage that. And also um, like I can, I can label hyper focusing or like being in a flow state a superpower for me, but there's many people that can't like identify or associate. Uh, like their journey and their disorders as that. So I guess we just have to be mindful and remember that like not everybody sees their disorder as a superpower as well. So yeah, that's all for me. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really wanted to hear from you. Um, and how diverse the experience can be. Um, the Lancet article states that individuals with similar clinical presentation can have very different um, neurocognitive and genetic profiles. Um, Irina, maybe this question is to you. What does this mean in terms of the significance of the clinical model of neurodiversity? I know you indicated a little bit about it in your first question, but maybe yeah. if you have something on it. I mentioned that, um, and indeed there is evidence that uh, people with very similar uh, presentations have um, uh, quite heterogeneous uh, neurocognitive and genetic makeups. Part of it can be about the way we measure things. Um, so um, there, there is a lot more to be done in the research space um, for us to be able to um, uh, measure the neurocognitive traits in a way that is reliable. So part of the heterogeneity they, that we observe can come from, um, from the way the things are measured. But um, at the same time, there is undoubtedly uh, a wide range of uh, neurocognitive phenotypes uh, within um, groups of people that are diagnosed with autism spectrum uh, and even the same disorder within that. And moreover, the parents of uh, people who are diagnosed uh, with autism spectrum disorders very frequently um, have uh, measurements of the uh, different uh, uh, neurocognitive traits that are not in the disease range but are um, uh, quite far away from what uh, one would consider the, uh, the standard range. So there are, um, even from a genetic standpoint, we can see this wide spectrum um, of uh, neurocognitive traits. So um, that does link into the neurodiversity um, uh, concept, which um, again, I, I do want to mention that it applies to almost all um, areas of mental health. Bec we do think about it uh, and the discussion has uh, come about a lot more uh, for um, autism and ADHD, but we can definitely apply it to anxiety, depression um, and so on. Yeah, and while we are on the subject of speaking about the clinical model, um, I I wanted to touch on 
diagnosis. So the fourth article says that the only way to approach to the only approach to the diagnosis of ADHD, autism, dyslexia, or Tourette syndrome was to focus on what is perceived as broken. Um, Sam, has this approach changed in diagnosing neurodivergent people? I think you're mute. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I've, I've got it. Uh, so I think it comes down to individual practitioners and diagnosticians, but we are seeing a shift. And just to say as well, yeah, diagnosis is, is a tricky, hard task, though, and it, it does come from a medical model, though I think there's still value and utility uh, definitely in, in diagnosis, um, though uh, the hard and fast lines as being as discussed are difficult at times and some some are grey. The or, focusing on autism again, the autism CRC's release released diagnostic guidelines. I think one of the interesting parts of that is that in these guidelines for autism diagnosis, they recommend a support needs assessment is done prior to the diagnostic assessment. So shifting that focus away from just simply deficit to perhaps also more importantly, well, what supports and accommodations it might need to be put into place to help empower and achieve a good life. Um, back to the individual practitioners part and um, one of the projects that I've been involved in, uh, we've been developing an impact of diagnosis scale. So trying to understand sort of the psychological impact when somebody receives one of these diagnoses, focusing on autism to begin with, but it might be an area that we can explore, uh, something we can explore in other areas as well. And what's been uh, at least uh, somewhat heartening from our Australian data that we've gathered so far focused on autism is that most autistic adults um, sort of were relatively positive about the clinicians who were um, helping them, supporting them through the diagnostic process. That what was really problematic was the post-diagnosis support uh, that there was very little for autistic adults once they'd received the diagnosis and almost to the point of why do I go to all this effort to get a diagnosis when it doesn't make me eligible for NDIS and doesn't really make me uh, help me access any other supports because there's not a lot that was out there. So I think that's an area I need more work on. Um, another thought is uh, I was chatting with Tony, Dr. Tony Atwood, many of you um, might be aware of. And something that he does, which I think is really great and to help shift that deficit focus uh, is when uh, for anybody recently diagnosed through his clinic, he has a resource uh, CD, DVD and a sort of a, so that he shares with people that talks about, you know, both the, the strengths and the difficulties and possible uh, avenues of access and support and strategies that might be helpful. Um, and just the last thing, if I could, I just want to go back to the Forbes article because I think sometimes there can be a problem with language that we use sometimes and it might be better for us to talk about aptitudes and abilities rather than superpowers or genius or things like this that not all autistic people uh, have genius level abilities and though the majority of autistic people I'd suggest would have you know differences and different ways of thinking that can be really useful and you know, some of the employment work that we did uh, and in this area they're starting to talk about the autism advantage. I think that's a good way of thinking about some of these things that um, and for somebody who is newly diagnosed that there might be individualized accommodations that are needed to harness this autism advantage uh, and there might be difficulties still even with accommodations so there is um, strengths and differences that are important that we need to harness here and um, some of those accommodations that we need to make overall is that to achieve trying to achieve a more inclusive and welcoming society where people are allowed to be themselves amongst others and they don't have to mask or camouflage their autistic identity. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for highlighting on that language barriers when it comes to either addressing neurodiversity or addressing individuals who identify as neurodiverse. It's definitely something that we need to learn from and also from what you mentioned before, the need for support. Um, maybe Aaron, if you could highlight some current initiatives and programs that are in place for in place at UNSW for students and how might we improve them to better support students? Uh, right, so um, as I mentioned previously that um, I'm working on a project which is a student-led co-production project called Diversified. 
which um, has the aim to alleviate neurodiversity awareness and the student voice in course design. Um, so we are wanting to create an inclusive, accessible world that works on replacing the typical hierarchical teacher-student relationship with a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, creating a culture of cooperation and inclusivity. Uh, information about this project has been added into the chat, so if anybody is interested in registering, please register and come along to the up-and-coming uh, events. The first workshops this Friday um, and workshops will be mapping issues and responding as a team with also producing ideas, creating prototypes and strategies to make courses more inclusive for everybody. Um, so basically we want to get um, like the student's perspective, um, like a neurodiverse student's perspective um, specifically, um, just to find out what problems students are having in regards to um, anything really related to UNSW or like their, their coursework because um, like I for sure have many problems that I've kind of um, experienced and we just basically want to cluster all these problems together and then run workshops to find solutions which we will then um, be showcasing to UNSW to um, gain traction to try and change and raise awareness also for these things. So. Um, it's exciting times and um, yeah, the links have hopefully been um, added into the group chat for everybody to um, see and potentially register if they're interested. But um, yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, thank you for that. And just on that, um, in our post event uh, email, we'll make sure to add that in. So if anyone's interested um, to take part in the diversified program. Uh, speaking of programs as well, maybe Isabel, if you could quickly give an, um, like an outline of, you know, the connections, programs that you've been involved with at UNSW for students and the opportunities that people can get involved in. Absolutely, thank you. And thanks, Aaron, your project sounds so fantastic. I can't wait to check it out. That sounds so cool. It's amazing to hear about students doing such amazing things like this for other students. <laughs> Uh, so from my perspective, what I've been working on uh, most recently is um, I have started up a program called Activate UNSW. It's on its third iteration now, so it's starting to really gain momentum. And essentially, this is a peer support program for students who are new to UNSW, who identify in some way with having a disability, a long-term illness or a mental health condition. Uh, and they can join this program and be mentored by senior students who also identify in this same space uh, and also have some social opportunities. Because something that I feel really passionately about is I think we have some fantastic uh, in-classroom supports, our educational adjustments through the equitable learnings, uh, team is fantastic, uh, but I'm really passionate about the co-curricular space and making sure that there is still space alongside our learning and our academic lives for fun, where people feel like they can be included, they can really let go and have fun, because I know as a young person, Back in the day, I feel that that is a space where you really find yourself, you really have opportunity to, to be trusted, to take risks and be silly and date and all of those things. And these are really important to finding our identity. And I feel that everyone should have access to this. Uh, and so I've started this program as a little bit of a start to, to build some community because I think something that we, we need to work on a little bit more at the university is being a bit more proud of having disability. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having a disability, with needing some extra supports. Disability isn't a dirty word. It's not a rude word to say about somebody that they have a disability. It's something that we need to talk about a little bit more. Uh, and it's something that we need to create more space for as well. So I want to start promoting all kinds of social opportunities around the university that are accessible and make sure that all of our different kinds of opportunities as well have space for people to say what their needs are and I think that's a really important thing and we do have quite a few accessible 
different events through ARC and all of these sorts of things, but we need to just talk about it a little bit more, promote it as an accessible event and a space where disability inclusion is welcome and these sorts of things. So um, I'm definitely working on that in Activate. We also run a live chat online peer support program as well which essentially is a very non-committal way of coming online and getting a little bit of support. Uh, it means that it can be a little bit more anonymous. It means you don't have to sign up for a program. And we have some really great trained students who are senior students and they can then help you out. Uh, you can ask any question you want and, and they can talk you through finding a good community space as well. Uh, something that I do recognise though is that we are complex intersectional beings and I want us to have choice. I don't want us to feel like if we have a disability, we have to go into the disability program. So something I'm trying to do with my team is to work on every different kind of peer support program around the university and see how we can make them more inclusive as well. And likewise, in my disability champion work, we're looking at the whole university. We're doing a bit of an audit at the moment um, and seeing where people are, are being left out, where there are barriers and how we can break them down and where we can make spaces more inclusive. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit of what's going on. And I hope that actually next year as well, we're going to have a little bit more to promote as well while we continue to grow and create more community spaces. And absolutely the most important thing as well in all of this work is that everything is done in collaboration with students, students as partners, students' voices at the forefront of everything that we're creating. So it's that real nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Um, and I really want to make sure that that is at the heart of everything we do. Thank you. Thank you for that rundown, um, Isabella. Um, and just on, you know, promoting that idea of discussion, I can see that a lot of people have put in some questions in the chat. So maybe we'll go through some of them um, and address them as well. Um, so just having a look right now, there's a question uh, from a panelist. Uh, Josie B. I understand she might be also involved in Diversify. Um, says that as someone who has um, ADHD, anxiety, severe TBI, depression, I completely understand the burnout. So much crossover. I wonder how much of this is environmental. Um, so maybe Sam, um, do you want to address that question? So I can only uh, speak to uh, the autistic burnout research that we did, um, which suggests that the environment played a large factor in the stresses leading to the autistic burnout from what our participants uh, were telling us. Um, <clears throat> I think in other areas it will probably apply also. The, the burnout construct itself uh, is a bit separate to autistic burnout, though there is a burnout construct that's a bit contested around what's burnout, what's depression, what's the separation between them. Um, burnout uh, historically has been linked more so to employment, but there's uh, then you're seeing it applied in other areas like autism, of course, then, uh, but you know, students and other uh, the people who aren't necessarily employed or, uh, or carers getting burnout. So I think it's, it's an area that's um, a bit uh, contested and controversial at times. But I think, yeah, the autistic burnout, just going back to the question, uh, definitely the environment and the, the, the unaccommodating aspects of the environment that the person has to navigate daily, um, the toll and the ongoing stress and fatigue of that leading to the more in, acute, intense, debilitating burnout states. No, absolutely. Um, just on that as well, there are some people asking, is there a way for them to take part in research such as yours? Um, unfortunately, at, at, at this point, the the um, all the studies, I'm, I'm not recruiting at this point for these studies, the autistic burnout. Uh, we were hoping to continue work in this area, but we uh, haven't secured um, funding to do it at the next stage of research that we'd like to do, though hopefully into the future. Um, the work I'm doing around contribution is only starting uh, in the near future, um, though, uh, yeah, not recruiting at this point, my apologies. But thank you, though, for uh, 
it's you know participating in research we need people to participate in research in order to move things forward so uh, when you see the research uh, recruitment things come up it's very difficult to recruit so i encourage people if when you see recruitment opportunities come up to to take them up then that's a, that's a great point you bring since a lot of us here are researchers or, or students who are in science who are researching and part of research so it's a really good point you bring there um sam um maybe and the next question is probably to isabel or maybe aaron as well um how can service deliver delivery for people who identify as neurodiverse be improved and adapted to meet varying individual needs so maybe aaron Well, I guess uh, like through this diversified project, um, like students are going to be able to uh, like bring their personal like, problems into this project and then find solutions on like, uh, moving forward from this, but also like how to implement these solutions within a university um, environment. So I think like getting on board for this project would be one thing. Um, but also like I, I think that like this might have something to do with like ELS or something like that, but um, the equitable learning services, but potentially like a more um, uh, what's the right word? Like uh, more suited kind of like uh, learning plan for students more personalized i think would be uh a better way to go through this i think as well so yeah i think yeah yeah thank you for that um isabel do you have anything to add to that sure sure and i absolutely agree with you aaron it's all about personalization and the only way that we can do that is to ask the question uh, ask students what they need what they want and create uh, programs that suit that and then be willing to adapt because times change. Look at this year, we've had a year of constant change and constant uncertainty. We need to move with what the students need uh, and how they move and change. So we need to be ready to be adaptable and flexible uh, and constantly have our ear to the ground. So uh, making sure that there are very clear feedback channels so that students can speak to us at any time of the program, but so that they also have choice and control. And I know that this is uh, an NDIS catchphrase, um, that choice and control one, but it is really important for empowerment for students to feel like they are being heard, they're being understood, and that we're creating solutions to their problems that they've addressed. So um, I think that's the most important thing for creating things that suit uh, diverse and individual needs and making sure that we have programs that are set up so that we have support for each person as an individual and we're not creating big blanket it rules because one person has expressed one need. That, that's me, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, maybe we'll move on to the next question on, um, someone asked, is it common for people who are diagnosed with autism to also have other neurodivergent rel relatives? So maybe probably to you, Irina, have you seen that um, in your study? So I think I, uh, Sam could answer that question, so probably he's more in the clinical space than I am, but uh, that is absolutely the case. So, uh, for example, anxiety is a frequent um, uh, trait associated with autism. Uh, obsessive compulsive uh, uh, behaviours are part of the autism uh, spectrum. Sam, any other thoughts uh, from you? You're muted. Uh, there we go. Just to the, the concept of the broader autism phenotype, I think is uh, uh, related to this question where they find, I think we was touched on before, that there can be, yes, there's more often that there'll be siblings in the family or uh, other relatives who are also 
uh, autistic if there is an autistic person in the family, but then they can also be people who might meet what's called the, the broader autism phenotype where they don't have that, meet that sort of cutoff for diagnosis of autism, but there's still uh, several um, traits or characteristics uh, that are more uh, heightened levels than you might otherwise expect. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, for that. I um, hope that I answered the question. Um, just maybe last question before we start wrapping this event up. Um, uh, Josie also says that I think that there is way too much shame wrapped up in the neurodiversity uh, experience. How do we lift that shame in a tangible way? Um, I think, Isabel, you were talking about creating a sort of community and listening to individual needs. Um, that might be helpful. Yeah, I think that um, shame is the result of us fearing ridicule, is the result of us hiding things away. Um, it's the result of not having visibility and not having open conversations. Um, it's the result of students having uh, educational adjustments, but being feeling like maybe if they talk to their tutor that there's something wrong with them or that the tutor doesn't know how to speak to them and they feel there's an all there's a real awkwardness about it. All of this is is part of the student experience right now around shame and shame around who you are and, and needing support. And I think that the best thing that we can do to try to keep lifting that stigma and um, keep lifting our, all of our uh, appearance of disability at the university is the opposite of shame, which is pride and showing that we are a proud community and that we are proud of our identity as disabled people or as people with disability uh, and continuing to create more and more visibility, continuing to create more conversations, continuing to have spaces where students with disability can talk about how they want to speak about their disability and if they have a disability support plan or an educational adjustment um, they they need a space to say to tutors okay this is you can ask me about this i'm i'm not ashamed of it and you know we need to start having more spaces like this where we can have really great conversations and i know that there are going to be some really great more talks coming up in diversity fest too uh, so i definitely encourage everybody to go along to that uh, and encourage encourage your friends to as well, um, because the more that we have visibility and pride in who we are and have more people with disability coming out and speaking about their strengths and about their challenges as well and about how they want to talk about their challenges, uh, this is a really good thing and this is going to keep moving us in the right direction. If I can just mm -hmm. quickly follow up on uh, what Isabel just said. Um, uh, it's really so important and I'm really hoping that everyone who struggles uh, with any kind of disability really nurtures that sense of pride. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is that oftentimes, um, you know, when someone has a disability and achieves something, the effort that it takes to get there is so much greater. Um, and uh, believe it or not, a lot of people would cheer uh, for you. Uh, just last semester, I had a student in class was doing so well despite a disability that was, you know, I, I could see how much effort went into that. And I was quietly cheering that he would do, you know, amazingly well in, in the course just because I realized um, that that really we should probably even mark twice as much uh, for getting to the same point uh, for uh, the effort that went into that. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope that uh, everyone is uh, trying to um, you know nurture that sense of pride and all of these initiatives that uh, you guys have and the programs are really great. Absolutely agree with you there. Um, keeping in mind the time. Uh, we have now reached the end of today's event. Thank you everyone for joining us virtually. And I would also extend a sincere thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing your expertise, experience and time with us today. I have learned a lot and I know the audience have also learned a lot and hopefully we've gotten a few more initiatives that we can get behind. 
Um, a huge shout out to Natalie Lee and Zoe Webster, as well as the entire team of Batra for helping make this event possible. I would also like to thank Michaela and Carlo from UNSW Science EDI for guiding us and helping us with the first student-led inclusive science seminar. And again, this presentation has been recorded and will be available to those who have registered for this, for this event. We also have a limited number of copies of the book, Nothing About Us Without Us, that we are sending to people who might be interested. It is a great resource to learn more about neurodiversity. If you're interested, please fill in your details in the post-event evaluation form, which will be posted in the chat. Also, next week, UNSW Inclusive Science Series event will take place on um, October 28th and will feature current UNSW science students as well as they tell stories of their science role models and reflect on the importance of inclusive representation in science history. Um, you can register for the event by clicking on the link in the chat. Thank you everyone and have a lovely day ahead.